Praise the Lord. Amen. Appreciate you guys. Done a great job leading us. We appreciate that so much. Amen. Hallelujah. Reconnection, you're dismissed. Reconnection, you can go. Praise the Lord. Is that a toothpick? Is what that is? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You guys good? Say, are you blessed tonight? The Lord is good, right? His mercy endures forever. Amen. Let's get our offerings ready to go tonight. We're going we're gonna to give tonight. You guys know how to do this, so we're going to give tonight, not gradually or necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. So. Again, just worship the Lord with your finances, man. Speak over your finances. Amen. This is an offering to the Lord. As we give those offerings to the Lord, man, I'm telling you, God sees your faith tonight. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, again, we thank you, Father. This is a part of the of service that I, that I never want to take for granted. It's a part of this service, God, that we can give to you. Not because uh, we have to or you're a, a God that's just demanding something. But, God, we give out of love tonight. And, Lord, we thank you as we give these offerings to you. It's... Lord, we want to get you involved in our finances. We don't want to block you out. So, Lord, we yield our finances to you. We yield our finances to you. And, Lord, tonight as we give, you're breaking selfishness out of our lives. Lord, we could be taking this money and doing something else with it. But, God, you're breaking selfishness out of our lives. To where, Lord, it's not about us. It's about you. The less selfish we are the more that your kingdom can break through. So God, we give tonight. We thank you for our church tonight and all that you're doing here in this house. We give, Lord God, not to an organization. We do give to you. But God, as these finances come in, it takes care of business. It takes care of utilities. It takes care, Lord God, of the place that you have placed us. And as family, we do our part to take care of the house. So, Lord, we give you praise for that tonight. So we give to you because we love you. Thank you, God, that every need of this church is met. And we have more than enough. So we give you praise. I bless the offering tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, ushers, and help the folks. Um, one, just basically one big announcement, right, is our boxes of love for Haiti. Um, a lot of uh, sad news coming out of Haiti today. Um, with uh, the assassination of the president there of Haiti. Um, I thought maybe that this was some type of covert. My question was, was like this some kind of covert assassination in order to topple the government to put somebody else in that would need to be in. But uh, I talked to Faith today, but I guess this was more about, you know, it's a win for the opposition. Um, so anyway, um, lots going on, uh, Faith messaged me today and said Paniel has said that the compound there in Haiti is completely locked down I mean there uh, it's I mean he hasn't been home I think she said in a week so uh, a lot going on in Haiti so let's continue to pray and uh, uh, for that nation but this is the time of year our Christmas in July for our shoe boxes our boxes of love so you know uh, Get those in for those kids, and let's uh, let's give uh, our kids and Cassie. You know, they go to Haiti, but we always kind of designate our boxes out towards the church that we built built there. And how many was it total we need? Yeah, five hundred and twelve kids. So they're in that school. So we want to make sure we give them a good Christmas. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. I'm going to switch up here. Thank you, Jesse. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. You guys good? Anybody cold in here tonight? Nope. Good. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Go with me to John 17. I feel like I'm in a barrel tonight. I don't know what's going on. So I don't know if you can help me get that adjusted. I'd appreciate that. Uh, John chapter 17. Um, I want to go to verse 14. I want to start there. Um, we've been in a series called Compromised, and uh, 
we've been talking about how we cannot, um, we live in this world, but we have to watch that we don't um, get contaminated by the world's systems and how the world operates, okay? And that's very important for us uh, as Christians. And I started out this series, I uh, really didn't anticipate to kind of go this long, but I was, uh, I was just thinking about how there's a lot of people today that just doesn't think like, uh, there's a lot of believers that just don't think like Christians. They don't think like people that have um, kingdom mentality and uh, we almost like there's a chameleon um, type of thing that goes on and there ought to be a difference between us and the world. Can I get a good amen? Continue to adjust me up there, please. Um, in John chapter four, 17, verse 14, we're going to continue on here. I want to be practical with this tonight and give us some things to really think about. Here in verse 14, it says, I have given them, this is Jesus speaking, this is his high priestly prayer, and he said, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, Jesus starts here, and he says, he's talking about his disciples. He says, listen, I've given them your word. He's talking to the Father. He says, I've given them your word. They've received the message, and they've actually actualized this message and started actually putting this message to work, right? They started putting this message to work, and it was actually changing them. I mean, these disciples, I mean, they were rugged, I mean, uh, fishermen, right? I mean, Jesus calls them, you know, I mean, could you imagine? I mean, uh, and he gets a hold of them, and he dedicates his time in, and he says, I'm going to invest in these 12. And it, his message was beginning to change them, the way they thought, the way they responded. He says, man, he says, I've given them your word. I've given the message. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. This message was transforming them. Verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. <clears throat> Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So Jesus said, they're not of the world, just as like I am not of the world. That word world, there's the Greek word cosmos, and it means the, the arrangement, how the, world, how the world is arranged, how the world operates. <clears throat> this, the systems of the world. He said, man, the systems of the world, they operate different than the kingdom of God. So Jesus said, listen, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Right? He said, I'm asking you to protect them. I'm asking you to protect them. Because it's never, listen, when we talk about this, it's never about isolation, it's about insulation. Okay? Now, that's where the message of Jesus transforms our thinking. We become different, correct? We become different. But we're not to be isolated from the world, we're to be insulated from it. It shouldn't be getting in us. Are you guys all right here? I mean, the wheat, I mean, even Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 13, he says, the wheat and the tares grow together. The wheat and the tares grow together. It, it has to. There's, there's a, we have to be mixed in with this thing. Going to get a good amen here. I've got to get mixed in. But it's in the mixing in of, of, the, of the leaven of the kingdom and I'm getting in the systems that I have to watch so I'm not getting compromised. Right? I'm not getting compromised. I mean, I, I didn't give you this scripture, Jeff, but let's go real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter or, uh, yeah, second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I just want you to look at this real quick. This is Apostle Paul. <clears throat> now, you know, there's a long story here about what happened, but he's addressing this guy that, that was, uh, it was a sexual immorality that was going on in the church. Um, they weren't addressing that sexual immorality. Uh, they were actually celebrating that sexual immorality. And Paul has to deal with this. Now look here. He said, I wrote in verse 9, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. 
I wrote to you, I wrote to you, verse 9, I wrote to you in my epistle. Now, this is the first, this is the first epistle we have right here. There was a lost, there was a lost, there was an, a lost epistle that historians believe that, that the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He says this, I wrote to you in my epistle. So there was some type of epistle, some type of writing that was given to this church prior to 1 Corinthians that we have. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. So evidently he was getting on them about doing what was going on, but he had to write again to correct it because I guess they were isolating themselves totally from people in the world. Now look here in verse 10. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world <laughs> or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would, you would need to go what? You'd have to, you'd have to leave this earth. What, what's the point? The point is, is this, is that you and I are to be mixed in with the culture, not isolated from the culture. Sinners what? Hello? Sin or sin, that's what they do. Right? That's what they do. And we got to begin to get secure in our faith and who we are, right? And be able to be amongst people. And that doesn't mean, I'll show you that in a minute, it doesn't mean we have fellowship and partnership with people that, uh, of darkness. That's not what it's saying. It's not what we're saying here. But we're in this world. We're not of this world. We are to engage the culture. Everybody say engage culture. So the mission can be very messy. If you're looking for clean, squeaky clean Christianity, this is probably not going to be that for you. Right? Because people, whatever, there is no poopless cows. It's just true. Where there is, listen, if there's no oxen in the stall, Proverbs says what? The crib is clean. Or it might be Ecclesiastes. I can't remember. But that's what it says. Where there's no, there, if there's no, there's nothing in the barn, you ain't got anything to shovel. But anytime you got people, you got poop. Amen. Because the mission is messy. Right? So, I mean, I know you guys have, I, I'm preaching to, to the people of the choir tonight here. I know, I know you know this, but we're just going to say it for the sake of the people that's watching online because they really need to hear it. <laughs> Is that we expect people come into the church, right? I mean, and, and they come in with all kinds of problems and situations and they give their heart to Jesus. We can't expect them just to get up from an altar or a, 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 a commitment and just expect everything just to... Voila, change, right? I mean, it, it's a process. And it takes time for some people to walk out of stuff. And we got to have grace. I'm, cer I'm certainly glad that God gave me grace. How about you? So we can't hide from the world. We got to engage it, right? So we're firemen. What do firemen do? They go do the fire. We're janitors. What do janitors do? They run to the mess. Right? When everybody's running away from the mess, the janitor's running in. When the kid has puked, Katie, right? <laughs> Steve, right? When the kid has puked, right? I mean, I mean, it's the janitor that's coming in. Everybody else is hiding out in the corner. Ew! The janitor is coming in, right? We're physician's assistants, right? We, I mean, physicians hang out with sick people. Right? So, so we... We go to the sick. So I just want you to know something. Physicians spend more time with the sick than the well. Now, this is interesting because Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 9. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. For I did not come to call the righteous, but I come to call the sinners to repentance. I want you to know something. Jesus was called in Matthew chapter 11, the friend of sinners. The friend of sinners. Jesus rightly related to sinners. And he didn't compromise. He didn't compromise. He wasn't a chameleon. He let his light shine. All right? Are you guys with me here? It's the same thing with you and I. We can do this right. 
The world is needing us. You guys know this. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. You can find this real quick upstairs. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's adjust that air just a little bit. If you wouldn't care. Maybe go up a little bit. Turn one off or something. It's the hardest thing, man. This room is the hardest thing to acclimate. In Ephesians chapter 5, let's look here in verse 8. It says this, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Right? The fruit of this light. Light has a fruit to it. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now look what he says here. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Expose them. So I want you to see this word fellowship. It means to partner with it. See, I can be in the world, not of it, and not partnering with darkness. Or participate. That's what the word fellowship means. Partnership and participation. I, don't, I can be a part of it. I can love people, right? I can, I can, I can, I can have dinner with a sinner. I can, have, be, be, I can be at, at my work and people, man, can be cussing all around me. I'm not going to lose my salvation off out of that. Right? But I'm not partnering with darkness. I'm not hooking up with it. Advancing the cause of darkness. That's not what I'm doing. Jesus said, listen, we're called, or Paul said, we got to be light. Right? We got to be light in this moment. Jesus was a friend of sinners. We are called to be a friend to people around us. Are you guys all right here? There's people that need us. I can be a part of it, but not be in participation with it. My job is to expose it. My light comes, and it causes change, right? It's that whole thing. When your, when your eye is good, your whole body, your actions are what? Full of light. I mean, even, even Jesus in John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We all know that, right? But verse 17 says it like this. I, if you just continue on and read, it says, For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't show up with some type of sign on a, on a, on a, on a street corner yelling at people. It's just not what he done. He said he didn't come to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Jesus, what is he saying? I'm going to become the standard. I'm going to become the light. And when Jesus walked in, light came and people said, I want to follow that. Now he's the head and we are the what? Jesus said, now you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world, right? So Jesus engaged the culture without compromising. Write this down. We can't afford to lose our voice. The church can't afford to lose its voice. We talked about in this series already how we are the, uh, the, 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 the support. We are the, the anchor of truth for the world. It, if there's no... There seems to be a grasping for a standard. And people today, you know, like, whatever your truth is, is your truth. And what my truth is my truth. And how can that even be? How can it really even be? I mean, if that, if that, if that road out there is 55 mile an hour, how can it? Well, that's not my truth. That ain't my truth. Maybe it's not. But the... <laughs> right? But there's a standard. Maybe we'll get into that next week. But what I'm saying is, is that we have to have some anchor, and the church is to be the anchor. To be the anchor. Are you guys with me here? And, man, people have bad experiences, and I hate this, and, but I hear this all the time. I really do. I just had a conversation with somebody the other day, and they were in my office and <clears throat> um, just sorting through some things in their life, and they're new here, and... And, and they just talked about how their whole, like, the, the exposure to religion they had. I'm thankful I didn't have to walk through all that stuff. I don't know about you, but I'm certainly glad about that. 
But there's a lot of people that's had been burnt by it. Amen. Burned. And so it's almost like I told them, I, I just told them, I said, let's just go back and learn again. Let's not throw it out, but let's go back and learn again. Let's rebuild now what's right. Right? So, so there has to be the standard, and, and the church is this standard. The church is a standard in the world, and it's important that we don't lose our voice. Apostle Paul said it like this in Philippians 2. He said, do all things without complaining, disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Jesus said it. Again, we've already quoted it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned, right? If it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and be trampled underfoot by men, you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. I think it's interesting. Again, I, I talked about this already, I think, in some point over the last couple of weeks. But, but it's interesting that Jesus talks about salt and talks about light. Salt is also a metaphor for wisdom. And being wise and having the mind of God. And he says right here, he says, uh, if the salt, of, he said, you are the salt of the earth. You're the one that brings wisdom and the mind of God and the seasoning into the world. We do. But if the salt loses its flavor, and that word loses its flavor in the Greek is the word, Greek word morano, and we get the word moron. If, 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 if people become, if the church becomes moronic, they become, they, they become foolish. The Bible says now our salt's not good for anything. And the next thing that's mentioned is light. Why? Because you know what? They would actually sprinkle salt onto light in order to cause it to become brighter. So it's the wisdom of God, right, that causes our light to shine. Moving with, remember now, not thinking just about God, but what? Thinking what? With God. We got to think with him. And that's how we think. It's wisdom. So Jesus is saying, you're the salt. You're the light. So we, we can't afford to lose our voice. Now, all truth and no love, all right? And this is how we lose our voice. All truth, right? All truth, no love, always comes out hate. Okay? That always equals out. It always comes out as hate. Right? Well, don't you know the Bible says? Well, the Bible says head coverings, too. In the Bible, there's a lot of stuff the Bible says. Right? Don't cut your hair. Don't wear makeup. Don't wear pearls. Don't wear jewelry. I mean, there's a lot of stuff the Bible says. Now, we don't have time to go in and just because, and we have to understand something. Just because the Bible was written, it wasn't written to us. The Bible was not written, written to us. It was written for us. So all of a sudden, man, somebody gets out their King James machine gun Next thing you know, man, they got people laying all over the floor. That's what that person was telling me. It just the, the, the heaps of condemnation that comes on somebody. It's all truth, no love is hate. All love, no truth is hypocrisy. Right? All truth or all love, no truth is hypocrisy. So there's a blending of truth and love. And that blend, it brings strength, it brings confidence, it brings conviction, <laughs> it brings change. John 1 14, the word of faith flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. This is John 1 14. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. There was a, he showed us how to do it. This can be done. Rich young ruler comes to Jesus. What do I need to do to have eternal life? This is the question. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. Well, he said, he said, keep the commandments. Well, I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. But still something's missing. And the Bible says this in Mark chapter 2, verse, Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Let's listen to this. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said unto him, you still lack one thing. 
sell all you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. Jesus loved him, looked at him, loved him, and said something to him. And he challenged him to change. And we can do the same thing. But you see that. It says he what? He looked at him. He loved him. And he said to him. Those three things. See, I, I don't have, I, I'm going to go here in a minute, but I don't want to jump too quick. But see, he looked at him. See, every person wants to be seen. They want to feel safe. And they want to be loved. If you can give three, those three things to anybody, they will feel fruitful, fulfilled. They'll feel like, man, you've made a connection. Jesus was making a connection to him. I looked at him. I see you. I see you. I see you. Right? I'm loving you. So, this can be done. Now, those that cry tolerance in our world are really the least tolerant. You ever notice that? The people that are crying for tolerance are the ones that actually are the least tolerant. Because why? They don't want unity. They want uniformity. This is why it's such a great opportunity for the church and the body of Christ to model. I mean, we live in a world today, we're hearing a lot about racism and it's all this stuff that's demonic, this stuff that's being uh, instructed and taught and things are going on. It's demonically influenced very much so. It has no business in the church. Uh, I'm not saying there's, there, there's not issues. That's not, my, that's not what I'm saying. But I, what, I'm, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying to you is that if we don't watch out, we'll let things come into the church that the world has ideas when it's not in the kingdom. See, listen, racism shouldn't even ever even exist into the body of Christ, ever. It should never even exist. It shouldn't even be a conversation for us. Right? Why? Well, I mean, because it, we're, all, we're all in Christ. Right? Red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in God's sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. If there's one place that people ought to be able to find safety and a harbor of hope, it should be the church. Right? Just like women and all the stuff that we have saw and been taught throughout the years about oppression. Listen, it doesn't exist. It should never exist inside the church. There's neither Jew nor, there's nor, nor Greek. There's neither male nor there's neither female. There's neither bond nor free. But we're all one in Christ Jesus. So the people that are cr crying out tolerance are the least tolerant. Right? Now, let me just define tolerance real quick to you. What is toler to tolerate? To tolerate. The word tolerate. Ready? From the dictionary. To recognize and respect others' beliefs and practices without sharing them. To bear or put up with someone or something not especially liked. Well, that's pretty biblical. That's not a bad definition. Right? Except that that's your spouse, right? But, but why? Because the Bible says in, the, in, in 1 Corinthians 13 that love endures all things. Right? I mean, so there's a, this type of tolerance, this, this type of tolerance, different, uh, differentiates between a person and their actions, right? I can differentiate, differ, differentiate, yeah, differentiate. I can differentiate between the person, that's the tolerance, is I can differentiate you as a person and what you're doing, right? I can tolerate, listen, you can, you can have your belief, whatever, okay, that's your belief. I can, I can talk, I have tolerance of that because why? I respect you as a person. I don't have to share that belief because today, if you don't share the belief with someone, that means you hate somebody. How crooked is that? So the new, listen, but, but the new tolerance today, you must accept what I do or you're a bigot, you're intolerant, everyone's beliefs, values, and truth must be the same, and you must approve of my sinful ways. No, that's not, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus done. Jesus showed love but didn't approve sin. Right? God demonstrated his love for us while we were yet a sinner. He died for me. 
But he just doesn't go and sit back and say, yeah, no, Jesus, what about the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery? Right? Well, it's a perfect example. I mean, she's thrown down naked. And Jesus gets down in her face. That's love. Why? Because he always wants to look somebody in the eye. Because I can see who you are. And this is not who you are. But he told her. Now, he was dismissing the jury. Right? The one that could have stoned her was right there looking at her in his eyes, but he couldn't even do it. Even, even if he wanted to do it, he could never have done it because he had all of his witnesses left. Because you couldn't stone someone without two, without two witnesses. So what's he do? He dismisses the, <laughs> the jury. That way, even under, under the law, it could never happen. And he tells her, he said, now go and sin no more. Don't, don't, don't do that. You're destroying. You're destroying yourself. You guys are right here. So I want biblical tolerance. Biblical tolerance. If a Muslim is sitting and talking to you, I can respect them. I don't have to approve or to partner with it, but I can sit there and have a conversation with somebody. I'm making sense here. How about this one? How about this one? Don't judge me. Right? That's a good one. Now, and I'm telling you something. Uh, a judge, of judging someone never wins someone to the Lord. But let me show you this one real quick. Go, put it up there on the screen. Matthew chapter 7. Let's look at this one real quick together. Just talking about don't getting compromised. Not being compromised. But, but don't judge me. Because there's a move. In the nation today, if you speak out, then you become a target. Right? If you, if you speak out, you become a target now. Now again, there, what's happening, if you don't watch out, the silencing of the lambs out there will creep its way inside the church, and now we won't have biblical discipline anymore. We won't have believers confronting other believers in love and doing what we need to do because we don't want to offend someone. When that's all through the New Testament... That we ought to have a relationship with one another. We see somebody getting off track. That we have a conversation with them and say, listen, man, what's going on here with you? Right? So, <clears throat> Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged. Verse 2. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Verse 3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but not consider the plank or the board in your own eye? Verse 4. How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye? Funny. Verse 5. Hypocrite? Well, that's... <laughs> Just stop there. I mean, how, how well is that going to go across today? Hypocrite? First, now, he's talking to the religious now. I mean, he's not really even talking to the world. You understand that Jesus, Moses, Jesus' ire was not towards anybody other than the religious. Hello. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. Verse 6. Do not give what's holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, is this scripture saying today, what, if we read this, judge not lest you be judged, is this scripture saying we are never to judge and just accept what everyone is doing? Absolutely not. All right? Because the scripture says in John 7, 24, Jesus says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Jesus said, you will know them by their... That's judgment. Right? Apostle Paul or, or whoever wrote Hebrews... He says, uh, discern both good. He said, we are to discern what's good and evil. We are to judge, right? So he's dealing. So what is, what is Jesus dealing with here? He's dealing with people being critical <clears throat> and condemning in their attitude towards others. Okay? You are, we are never to be condescending people. We are never to be critical of people. Even when people are blown up, right? I know it's tough, but we are not to be critical 
We can speak truth, but not be critical, right? Jesus is dealing here really about hypocritical judgment. What are you saying? After he says, don't judge, lest you be judged, he goes in with this whole story about moving, removing a board, that way you can remove a speck, right? What is he saying? Deal with you before you deal with anybody else. Listen, this is the key. If you and I would actually stop and reflect on our own selves first, we'll have a lot more grace and compassion to do something with, to help someone else. All right? So, Because a lot of times we get in the middle and we forget about our own flaws. We forget about the, own, our own, the fish that we were spit out of. Right? I'm, I'm going to read this to you. Um, now, it doesn't say we shouldn't help others or to address issues or remove the speck. Does it say that? It says first what? Okay, so, so, so we have a responsibility first to examine our own hearts. This is what Jesus is talking about. It's a hypocritical judgment that we're not taking ourselves into consideration. It's the pot calling the kettle black, right? It's that type of thing. It's, it's saying, well, you know, telling someone to do something, but yet you're not doing it yourself. And this is what Jesus is trying to address. He said, listen, I need you to, to, to really look at yourself first. Because whenever, whenever we start engaging the culture around us, listen, you need to have some compassion and have some grace. And the way you do that is by actually looking at the grace of God that, that has been extended to your own life and your own failures and mess-ups and screw-ups and, and stumbles. And it helps us. So it doesn't say we shouldn't, we shouldn't help others. We have responsibility first to examine our own hearts then help others. Now, this is interesting. Both a log and a speck, this is coming to, come to me today. Both, in a, both a log and a speck would take another person to help remove it. You ever had something in your eye? I mean, I'm talking about, I, I mean, I'm talking about drop you to your knees. I mean, some little small thing. I'm talking about, and you're like, oh my, you know, you're going to help me, help me, someone help me. Right? Is there something in there? Truth? I mean, you're pulling your eyelid down. That ain't working. Can you see it in there? <laughs> it's true. Because why? It takes some, both people, if you had a log in your eye, if you literally had a board in your eye, you ain't getting that board out by yourself. You're not. It, it, listen, this is both a log and a speck would take another person to help remove it. Listen. Before you start railing, you need to ask yourself, do you want that person to help you with the problems you're, not, you're, you're having? Because we're responsible, right? Jesus is saying, don't be hypocritical in your judgment. Just maybe that person will actually help you take the thing out of your eye. The person you're trying to say something to, to try to correct, maybe that's the person actually God sent to actually help you. So don't judge me, right? It's, 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 it's something that we, we deal with. I get it. I mean, but it's not telling us not to ever have a judgment. It's just saying, don't be hypocritical. And number two is, you're never to be judging someone's motive. I can judge actions whether that's wrong, right? But I'm not to judge their motive, their heart. I don't know their heart. You ever done that before? Well, I know why they've done that. Do, do, do I? Do I really know why they done it? Now, see, they're getting into a place of judgment that's no, no business for you to be in. Because that leads you down roads of offense, deeper into offense. Well, I know exactly why they done it. Do you? Probably not, because you don't know their heart. So, how do we engage with the culture? You guys all right? Can I get a good amen here? All right, uh, let me, let me, um, let's put up Colossians 4, 2 through 6 real quick. Engaging with our culture. This is where the nuts and bolts of this message is at. Uh, the nuts and bolts. Colossians 4, 2 through 6, it says this. Can, if you're going to, if you're, if we're going to engage culture, I need to have a prayer life. <laughs> Continue earnestly in prayer and be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Verse 3. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. Verse 4. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Verse 5. 
Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. He gives us some keys in here. Number one is this. Get inside. Verse 5, he says, you know, listen here. There's people on the outside, right? That's what he says. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. See, get inside the outsider's world. First thing, if I am going to engage culture, it's not standing on a corner holding a sign railing. The way that I'm going to engage the culture is by actually getting inside the outsider's world or establishing relationship with people. We want to be able to talk to people, reason with people, and that's going to take relationship. Now, back to Matthew 7, you know when he said, don't cast your pearls, right, among swine? That's what he's talking about. He said, listen, when you got this situation going on, you got a log, you got a speck. I mean, this is, it's, you're, getting, you're getting pretty personal with somebody. He said, but listen, if you don't have relationships with someone, don't be casting your per pearls among them. Don't do that. It's going to take relationship, getting inside the outsider's world and having relationship with people. People are just like you, right? I mean, if they, if they don't know Jesus, they're just like you. What do you mean? They have kids, they have spouses, they, I mean, they have emotions, they have feelings, they hurt. They're just like us, right? They're just not redeemed yet. See, we will always, this is so good, we will always live our lives out of two bowls. What do you mean two bowls? You'll live your life, I'll live my life, out of Pilate's bowl or Jesus' bowl. And we'll either wash our hands like Pilate. I'll wash my hands of this. Or I'll wash my hands in the bowl that Jesus, where he takes a towel. And he serves. And he washes dirty question is how do I live with dirty hands but clean feet how do I live in this world ministering to someone but yet keeping my feet clean my walk right but if we keep washing our hands of our society listen the church is the anchor you guys are right here now, I'm telling you something. Jesus is not afraid of the mud. Number two, look for the open door. That's what he says. He'd pray for me. Apostle Paul says in verse 3 of Colossians 2, he said, pray for me that a door would be open. Look for the open door. So how do I engage my culture? Number one, I've got to get inside the outsider's world, which means I'm going to develop a relationship with people. Right? Now, know, know, know the extent. I'm not partnering with darkness here. Right? I mean, I'm not partnering with darkness. You know, what, you know where the lines are at. At least you should. Right? But I need to, I need to have a relationship with people. And, and then I need to, to look for this open door. I mean, pray about it. Pray, pray for these people around us and pray. Pay attention. Number three, you got to speak truth. So he says, he says in verse 3, so I, I'm asking that you pray for me that a door would be open for the word of God to be preached, to speak the mystery of Christ. Speak the truth. I, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Yeah, it will. Now, be loving and kind and humble, right? Write this down. Jesus called us to be fishers of men, not winners of arguments. Right? See, people are my highest priority, not winning, not winning an argument. I'd rather be loved, right? I'd rather be loved than win an argument. I'd rather be loved. So I'm going to, I'm going to have the opp opportunity to speak the truth. And it's true, man. I mean, if I'm having a relationship with someone, I'm going to get the right to speak into their lives. 
People, listen, holding signs and yelling at people, people are going to turn you off. That's it. They just turned you off. But if I'm sitting down and not, I'm friends with them or we work together, man, I remember that, man, when I was in, in, in the hospital. I had people all around me. And the thing is, I would, I would, uh, I, there was all kinds of people. People certainly didn't believe like I did or agree, I didn't agree with their lifestyles. But they were just like me and, right? They, I mean, you know, they, they struggled at some stuff and they were good at some things and they had emotions and feelings and we'd sit down and we'd had food together, you know? But when it was an opportunity to speak, I spoke truth. I spoke the truth. Now, I don't have to be speaking truth. As people say, well, I just, I'm a speaker of truth by God, and that's what it's going to be. I mean, people say that kind of stuff. You just got the wrong stinking attitudes what you got. Amen. Right? Well, I'm just, a, I'm just a speaker of truth. Or I'll just tell people like it is. Well, that's why, that man, you, you come across as brash and you come across as hard and you come across as offensive and why nobody wants to hear you. Right? Well, I'm telling them truth. Yeah, I know. Again, just keep, keep getting that machine gun and just drive them away. But I can speak truth humbly. I can look at someone just like Jesus. I can look them in the eye and I can tell them the truth. We can do this, man. And when people are actually that secure in it, what begins to happen is, is that there's a conviction that comes with that. Ain't nobody want to follow anybody that does wishy-washy in what they believe. If you want the world really to listen, we got to get strong in what we believe. <laughs> and we don't have to be negative about it. We don't have to go here and push it down somebody's throat. I don't have to do it like that. But I certainly can be strong in my faith. Right? I can be strong in my faith. And it speaks well, at least they believe in something. They might not look at you and say, you know what, I don't know, I don't agree with anything they say, but at least they stand for something, man. That's why he says in verse 6, what's he say in verse 6? He says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. How's our speech? Listen, I want to help you. Just because somebody doesn't agree with you, listen, it's okay. It's just fine. Right? It's not changing anything. My faith is anchored in a, in a resurrected Jesus. I serve him. He's changed my life. Listen, you, I've been this way now for 24, almost 25 years. You know what? It ain't changing. I believe in Jesus. So whether somebody agrees with me or not, it's not going to shake my faith. But I'm going to let my speech be seasoned with salt, and I'm going to be ready to give an answer to everybody. For the hope that's in me. And the, and the last thing is this. <clears throat> engage in a culture. Walk. Before you talk. What's he say in Colossians 4. Colossians chapter. 4 verse 5. What's he say right there? He says what? Walk in what? Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. You got to walk before you ever talk. Listen, if it's not translating in your life, you can be like this. It ain't being heard. It's like Charlie Brown's. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, 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 wah. But when you hook up your talk and your walk, something starts to happen. You guys are right here. Protect your testimony. People will read you before they ever read a book or a Bible. You are the 67th book. The Bible, there are 66 books in the Bible. You're the 67th. Because people will read you before they ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if we want to get people to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we got to protect our testimony. It, it's important. Someone asked me recently about this, and they said, you know, when we was in a conversation about some things, and I said, you know, if you line 10 people up on the back wall, and I put five blue cans in five of their hands, that's Bud Lights, and I put five Coca-Colas in five others, if I asked a greater percentage of people outside of here, who are the Christians in the bunch? 
what do you think they would say? Now you say, well, I can drink, whatever. I mean, there's Christian liberty. I understand that. That's up between you and the Lord. I'm not here to, to teach tonight. I could tell you a, an oodle of bunch of reasons why that's not a good idea. But I'm not here. There's people that drink and drink wine and, and can drink an al- a beer or whatever. And that's fine. That's between them and the Lord. And I'm not here to throw a stone at that. I know the apostle, you know, we have that kind of stuff about in the scriptures of Christian liberty. <clears throat> but I don't ever want to cause someone to stumble. Period. I, that's anything. Well, that's just legalism. No, listen, I'm not bringing, listen, I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about your testimony. Right. He said, well, that's legalism. That's fine. You can call it what you want. But I know one thing. The apostle Paul said, if I eat meat and it causes somebody to stumble, now that's a big deal back then. You've got to go back and study that whole deal because it was stuff offered to idols. And there was liberty. And the apostle Paul said, I'm not chained to any of it. I can eat meat, Right? I can do what, but if it's going to cause somebody to stumble, I ain't going to do it. I'll never eat another piece of meat ever if it causes somebody to fall. My testimony is so important. My testimony is so important. Our integrity matters and the way we live matters. And when we say we're followers of Jesus, my talk, right? My walk matters. I can be saying, I, I love Jesus, and I can have bumper stickers and all the, the Christian t-shirts and all of it. But if I'm treating my neighbor bad, right? I'm cheating, on, cheating, on, cheating people out of stuff, and I'm doing stuff wrong. Are you guys all right? No, I'm, all right. All right. Uh, shoot. All right. Um, can I show you this one in 1 Peter 2.12? Um, in the in the passion, it says this: "Live honorable lives as you mix with unbelievers, even though they accuse you of being evil doer, doers. For they will see your beautiful works and have a reason to glorify God in the day He visits us." That's good, isn't it? As we mix, right? Wheat tears in the world, not of it. Let me give you these real quick here. Walking in, because uh, we got to close this down, but walking in love in the world. How do I do this? Like, how do I, Apostle Paul tells us to walk in love, Im, be imitators of God, and walk in love, right, as Christ love does. How do you do this? Walking in love. Love doesn't neglect. Jesus didn't require people to change before they came to him. Jesus sought out the sinners. I love it. He calls, he calls Matthew from the, from the tax collector's booth. What's so interesting about the whole thing is he's the tax collector for the fishermen. And this is the guy that Jesus pulls into the fold to be one of the guys with the fishermen that he'd been stealing from and cheating out and extorting for I don't know how long. Could you imagine Peter, James, John, Andrew? Are you kidding me? Could you imagine that backroom conversation with those four? Are you kidding me? We've left all and followed him. You know what? Hey, that guy's ripped us off. You know, he's ripped us off of so much money. Can you believe this? But Jesus, I guarantee, done it on purpose. <laughs> I guarantee done it on purpose. I'm going to find out. When I see Jesus, my first question, what, 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 let me, just get me that conversation again. Why would you do that? Because it's sandpaper people. They had to learn to love and walk together with somebody that was different than them. Love doesn't neglect, right? I want you to know something. Jesus fishes with a net and not a pole. And there's all kinds of people. People not like you, not like me, that Jesus loves expecting us to reach. Because when you start fishing with a fishing pole, you start fishing specific for certain things. I'm going to throw the bait for the bass. I'm going to throw the bait for the sunfish. I'm going to throw the bait for this. But a net, when it's cast, it's what? It's pulling them all in. Love doesn't neglect needs. Doesn't require people to be certain ways in order to serve them. I remember one time I was praying for somebody up here in a prayer line and 
just knew what was going on in our lives. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I didn't want to pray for him. Can I be honest with you? I got to fight some of this stuff. And this is what the Lord told me. He said, who are you to be a keeper of my table? It's all right, we'll pray. Because the table's set, and he says, come. Not whether you dressed right or whether you look, no. Love never neglects needs. Number two, love does not condemn. Doesn't condemn. Because love sees the value in a person. You've got to understand something, man. The lost... We are all, all of humanity's lost sons that's, that's needing rescued. I think the whole prodigal son, the prodigal father, his lavish love, he doesn't condemn. He aggressively seeks after hearts. Doesn't condemn. Doesn't want to punish. Doesn't say you're unfit for use. And the last thing is this, love does not ignore what do you mean love does not ignore? True love will go to the rescue of those that are drowning. Right? And truth is what makes people free. So we, love confronts. Love will tell the truth. If I don't be a person of truth inside of relationship and doing what I'm called to do, and I don't confront, then guess what? It's really not loving someone. It's almost like someone's drowning and I refuse to throw a life preserver out. Whether they agree with me or whether they... I can love someone, I can tell them truth. If I don't tell people truth, it's actually a reflection of not loving them. If I had the answer, why wouldn't I give it? Right? Right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy can't be trusted. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy can't be trusted. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. When I have somebody that tells me truth, that loves me, it's all out of that. Right? It comes out of it. So love does not ignore. So love doesn't neglect needs. Love doesn't condemn. But love does not ignore the truth. You guys all right? I'm done. Praise the Lord. Thanks for letting me finish that out. Praise God. Why don't you stand to your feet tonight? Amen. You guys all right? You get that? So let's just be, let's be people, man, that go to the rescue of people and engage our culture. Let's engage our culture right. We can do this right. Right? We're not going to be, man, the testimony that, you know what, I don't like that. I don't like church. I don't like Christianity because, you know what, all they want to do is whatever. I know truth can be offensive. It can be. And that's good. But if I'm doing it out of love, even if it hurts, right, they may get mad. Right? But that's okay. You've done it out of love. Preaching of the cross is foolishness, the Bible says, to those, right, that are perishing. But to us, it's the power of God. So preaching, sometimes we're talking to someone, it may pierce their heart. And it may cause them to get upset or angry. And sometimes that happens. But if it's coming out of love, you can walk with a clean conscience. Amen. So, Father, I thank you so much again for the opportunity tonight to be able to just to be here and to, again, Lord, just to take the word, look at what's going on, God. I know we, uh, we're, we're, we're people, God, you've called into our culture to be light, to be salt. And, Lord, we can do this right. And, Lord, as we become more salty, people become more thirsty. As we become more salty, Lord, the people will want to drink from the wells that we drink from. So I thank you, God, there's people all around us. We've been delivered, and Lord, you're sending us back to our friends, to family members, to our circles of influence at work. Lord, those people, God, that's in our path that need you. So, God, I thank you tonight 
that we'll see people. People will feel safe with us. We'll feel, they can be vulnerable with us. And Lord, they will experience love through us. That we'll look them just like you did, Jesus. We'll look them in the eye. We'll love them. And we will say to them. So I thank you, God, for relationships. There's going to be a targeting, God. I pray for a targeting with these people that they will target people around them to speak to them, to build relationship with them. People that are different. And Lord, they will go and build these relationships, God. And they'll love them. Not for the sake of trying to win them to you. Though, God, we want that. But God, these are people. And they have feelings. and they're, they're, I mean, they, We can love people and we can value them for who they are. Not for another notch in our belt. But God, to love humanity like you would love humanity. And with that, God, it will be just like Jesus. That they will say, fo- they will follow you. They will follow you. So God, I thank you tonight that you're helping all of us. I bless these people tonight as they leave. I thank you for their families. And I just ask you to bless them and continue to move and minister in all of our lives. Touch us. Make us more like you, Jesus, in every way. We love you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great Wednesday night, guys. We'll see you soon.